Hi. Blood supply to the cerebellum. That's a, that's a bit of a serious topic. Uh, the cerebellum. The, the, the little, the little Brian. Um, the blood supply to the cerebellum is particularly important. The cerebellum is involved in, I mean, it has major roles in managing posture, posture, muscle tone, movement coordination, and so much of that we take for granted. The fact that I'm able to move my eyes easily and look at the thing I want to look at, cerebellum's a big part of that. So when the cerebellum gets damaged, patients present with ataxia, loss of you know, muscle movement coordination, uh, nystagmus in the eyes, vertigo because their eyes are flicking around, they haven't got control, um, maybe changes to their speech, but pretty much any sort of movement that you can think of, I mean, look at the movements I'm using for speech and the coordination required for that, cerebellum. So the cerebellum is so important to movement. Um, and. There are three arteries that supply blood to the cerebellum on either side. Students find them difficult to uh, name and recognize and understand, so we're gonna do that now. Might as well do the veins as well, right? Because whenever else am I gonna talk about the veins that drain the cerebellum? And we'll come back to the clinical stuff at the end. Um, but suffice to say that um, if these arteries get occluded, by a clot, by a thrombus, that is a major way of damaging the cerebellum. And that damage doesn't just stop with problems with movement, it gets worse. So let's have a look at the anatomy. First things first, to help understand the words we're gonna use, um, so we've taken the cerebellum out and the cerebrum. Watch out for your syllables there, cerebellum. Um, and down here, we can see left and right vertebral arteries passing into the cranial cavity through foramen magnum. And the left and right vertebral arteries come together to form a single midline basilar artery which will eventually end as the left and right posterior cerebral arteries supplying blood to the posterior cerebral structures in here. And the arteries that supply the cerebellum are gonna branch from these structures. But notice this slope here. So as these arteries enter the cranial cavity and they run up this slope, the clevis, they are running, as they run anteriorly, they are also running superiorly. Do you see what I mean? So, as, yeah, so as, we, as we follow the flow of blood up and forwards, we're following these arteries, they're running both superiorly and anteriorly. So arteries at this end, you might refer to as superior versions and anterior versions, whereas arteries down at this end, you might refer to as inferior versions or posterior versions, all right? Here is half the cerebellum. Here's the other half. So they are, the cerebellum is surrounded by bone, and then we have some dura mater, that thick, tough, connected tissue holding everything in place. We have this tentorium cerebelli, ooh, which we actually have on there. And then, boom, that sits on top. So we have the cerebrum. So you can see, the brain stem here, the pons and the medulla. So as we're looking at this, as we see the cerebellum on either side, and we see the basilar artery up here, the gap we're looking at is left because I've taken the brain stem out. I've taken out the pons and the medulla. Uh, that means that arteries that are branching from, say, the basilar artery to run posteriorly to the cerebellum will pass around the pons or around the medulla, depending upon the level, which means they're gonna give off branches and supply blood to the brainstem as well. So the cerebellar arteries are supplying blood to the brainstem and to the cerebellum. So that's an important idea, because the brainstem is also very important. Um, okay, so what are the arteries we're looking at? Okay, so we gotta find three pairs of cerebellar arteries. Here's the trick. That's the first pair there, running posteriorly. Now remember the slope? So these arteries, both back here, are posterior 
and inferior cerebellar arteries, also called pica, posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. And they are running to the inferior surface of the cerebellum and the posterior surfaces of the cerebellum. So they're getting right in the back. It's also going to supply blood to the vermis, the bit in the middle. And also, of course, they're going past the medulla oblongata, so they're supplying blood to that. But look, these are branching from the vertebral arteries. So that's the first pair, pica. The second pair, as we slope anteriorly and superiorly, are this pair here. These are still inferior, but they are now anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. One on either side, so they get called AICA, A-I-C-A, anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. And look where these come from. These now are typically branching from that single midline basilar artery. They're going to run around to the cerebellum and they're largely going to supply the, like, the anterior surfaces of the cerebellum. And finally, as we follow our way up, don't bother with this one. This one isn't going to the cerebellum. It's going in here, to the ear. So that is a, an, it's not a cerebellar artery. So forget that one, but up here, don't get confused. So the basilar artery ends as the left and right posterior cerebral arteries. Just before it ends as a posterior cerebral artery, it gives off the superior cerebellar arteries. We're at the top of the slope now. These are the superior cerebellar arteries. They're gonna pass to the superior surfaces of the cerebellum the superior cerebellar arteries. If you really want to abbreviate them, SCA, but that's no way near as much fun as pica and aica. And that's it, that's your three pairs. Um, so if I, yeah, if I grab the cerebellum, difficult to get these in the right way around, but there you go, that, that there, The, that, what, what we can see there is we can see those superior cerebellar arteries flowing over the superior surfaces of the cerebellum, so supplying blood to those parts. Uh, and if I take that out and flip it around, we can see on the underside arteries on the inferior surface and on the anterior surface, and those join up in there with our anterior inferior and posterior inferior uh, cerebellar arteries. So that's how the blood gets to the cerebellum. Um, this means that the arteries of concern are the vertebral arteries. Pathology in the vertebral arteries in, in the neck, um, atherosclerosis for example, is uh, the most common cause I think of forming uh, clots, pathological thrombi, which could then pass up here, they'll pass up the vertebral arteries and they could go to the basilar artery and occlude one of our cerebellar arteries giving cerebellar signs or they could um, block the posterior cerebral artery, one of its branches, some of the branches go into the, the, um, uh, the brainstem or what have you. So vertebral arteries, cardiovascular disease, cerebellum is at risk. Veins, huh? Was this my idea or yours? Um, I know we've talked about, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> I think we've talked about cerebral veins. Do you remember that kind of, uh, there's the, the vein of Galen is, um, it's, it's, it's draining, it's like it's coming out there, the vein of Galen. It's like it's in the midline, it's coming out um, of here. And there we see the straight sinus. And the straight sinus is going to meet, around here we've got the transverse sinus. So if we look on, uh, that's a transverse sinus, that's a transverse sinus. The straight sinus is coming in here. So clearly, uh, the straight sinus lies su directly superior to the cerebellum and the vein of Galen is here. Um, so. I'll mention the specific veins, but we've got the vein of Galen, the straight sinus, the transverse sinus, and then around here, this is the petrous part of the temporal bone, we've got superior and inferior uh, petrosal sinuses.
the inferior petrosal sinuses down here. These are dural venous sinuses. This is where the veins of the cerebellum and the cerebrum are going to carry the blood to, um, and then the dural venous sinuses will take the blood largely out to the internal jugular vein. So there are superior cerebellar veins draining blood from the superior cere cerebellum that drain to the vein of Galen and the straight sinus. There are posterior cerebellar veins draining the posterior cerebellum and they drain to the transverse sinuses. And there are anterior cerebellar veins which drain anteriorly to the inferior petrosal sinus and they're draining the anterior cerebellum and they are highly variable. Veins, that's their want, is to be highly variable. So there are some named veins here, but I think that's a good way of thinking about them. So what we're thinking about here is ischemia of the cerebellum as a result of damage to one of these blood vessels. Either the blood vessel has broken and blood is leaking out from it, that would cause ischemia in a region of the cerebellum, or a clot, a thrombus, a blockage of one of these blood vessels, one of these arteries would lead to ischemia of the cerebellum. And then you will see cerebellar signs. Like I say, classically, it's presenting with, you know, nausea and vomiting because of the vertigo and loss of motor coordination, ataxia, like an ataxic gait, unbalanced, wide style. There's so much to the cerebellum, but those are like the classic signs. Cerebellar strokes make up about maybe two to four percent of all strokes, but cerebellar strokes possibly have a mortality rate twice that of cerebral strokes, so they're particularly dangerous. Why? More anatomy. Right, well, as I said, this is all bone, right? You've got the foramen magnum down there, but this is all bone. If the cerebellum becomes ischemic, you're going to damage the cerebellum. There are more neurons in the cerebellum than there are in the cerebrum. It's a really, really busy, highly cellular part of the central nervous system. Um, edema, so fluid collection, swelling will follow that ischemia. But there's nowhere for the cerebellum to swell into. I said that you've got the tentorium cerebelli there. That super tough dura mater is sitting on top of the cerebellum. Um, so if it swells, I mean, it could, there's a gap there that the brainstem goes through. So it could swell through, it become, through that gap there and become supratentorial. That's not a good thing. But also, um, we've got the ventricular system, right? You've got the third ventricle draining through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, which is in here. So swelling of the cerebellum may compress the cerebral aqueduct, may compress the fourth ventricle, prevent the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid will still be being made up here, which leads to raised intracranial pressure. If the pressure up here is high, there's only one way everything can go now, and it's that way. And it's likely then that the cerebellum will be pushed out. It will herniate out through foramen magnum. All of these things have bad outcomes. Um, so this needs to be recognized, treated ASAP, right? Because the cerebellum has a whole bunch of fun circuits managing all sorts of movements, it's also taking proprioceptive and other sensory pathways and the vestibulo-ocular reflex, which means that cerebellar signs can be very similar to vestibular signs. Oh, neuroanatomy. It's, it's a lot of fun, but the brain is incredibly important. This, well, you know, this, this is us, right? This is what it's all about. Um, okay, so that's the anatomy of the cerebellum. In terms of the blood supply, we worry about the blood supply because we worry about the blood supply being cut off to parts of the cerebellum and that being very dangerous. Um, but that's the method for identifying which is which. Okay, see you next week.